This episode is sponsored by Honey Badger. Honey Badger has your back when it counts. They're the only air tracker that combines air monitoring, uptime monitoring, and cron monitoring into a single and simple to use platform. Their mission is to tame production and make you a better, more productive developer. At the time of this recording, Rail 7 was just released, and with so, going forward, all the applications that I create on these episodes will be using Rail 7, simply because I want to make sure that these episodes are going to be accurate for as long as possible. And with this change, I've updated my Rails RC file to mainstream the setup a bit more, so I am skipping JBuilder simply because in a lot of these applications that I'm building, I exclude that by default, as it's typically not something we interact with. And then for the JavaScript, I am using ESBuild, which I found is the most similar experience to what we had with Webpacker. And now by default, I am using the CSS framework Bootstrap. So whether you're on a Rails 5, Rails 6, or even a Rails 7 application, I'm still going to try to make sure that a lot of these episodes will still follow that same kind of path, so you should be able to get value from them regardless. And whenever I create a new Rails application, I'll simply just do a Rails new template, and this is on the latest version of Rails 7 Alpha 2, and then I pass in a template to do some additional setup. Because one of the things that I found with a fresh Rails 7 application and I'll show you that without adding in the template, is mainly around the Rails scaffolder. And so once we have a project created with ES Build and Bootstrap, I'm going to navigate into this project, and I'm just going to generate a scaffold for a user with a first name, last name, and email address. And if I run the new bin dev command, that'll boot up the web server along with running the yarn for the JavaScript and Yarn for the CSS to compile those. So once we're at our application, I'll just navigate over to the users. I'll create a new user. And so the first thing you'll notice is that on the edit user, back to users, and destroy user, the destroy user is now a button instead of a link. If we go back to our list of users, I'll go ahead and create another one. Once we fill out the form, I'll create that user. I'll go back to the users, and this is at the user's index, and you see that they got rid of the table, and instead now it's just a list. And I found that this is not going to be the best presentation when doing an episode, so for these episodes, I have updated the templates to give a bit more of a familiar look. So I'll destroy that application, I'll create it again, except this time now I'll use the template. It's still going to use ES Build and Bootstrap, Except the main difference now is whenever I run the Rails Generate Scaffold, it's going to have a different look and feel than what a vanilla Rails 7 application would. And so once that's done, I'll go ahead and get into the project. I'll generate the scaffold, and I'll use the same scaffold as before. I'll run Rails DB Migrate to migrate the database, and then run bin dev to get things up and running. So now when we visit the template, you'll see that the UI is a little bit different. And if I go to the forward slash users, we're now back to a table. If we create a user, instead of having a destroy button, we have a destroy link. And the main difference here is that instead of a button to, I use a link to, but I added the data turbo method delete. So if we go back to our list of users, we see that it's in a table form, and we can also delete the record from here. And so the changes in the template that I've made in any controller that gets generated through the Rails scaffolder, on the destroy action, I've added the status see other, which will cause the application to refresh the page on the redirect back to the user's URL. If we did not have the status see other in here, then on the destroy action, the redirect to the user's URL would also have been a delete verb and that would have just messed some things up. And really, to accomplish all of this, my Rails template simply just adds a folder into the lib folder under the templates, and I just have the Rails scaffold controller, and then the controller rb.tt, and the only change I made in here was adding in the status c other. 
Under the ERB, Scaffold, on the index action, I've added in a table with the link to delete, and instead of a method delete, I just changed this to a data turbo method delete, and then it all works as we would expect. So I wanted to preface this episode with this because this is going to be the change going forward. And if you download the source code to these episodes, you should be able to get access to this templates folder as well. So in this episode, we are going to have a look at Global ID, some of the nuances with it, and we're going to look at a situation where you want to create an encrypted URL to basically protect the content. So we have a link here that takes us back to our application, but it takes us to a download path. And when we click on it, it downloads the file just as we would expect. But you would be able to generate this link and provide it in an email and you can make it expire after a certain amount of time. So if you're sending sensitive information, you wouldn't necessarily want to provide a direct unauthorized link to that file that anyone could download. And you may also want to provide some method of expiring that link just so they can't keep that email around forever and re-download that file multiple times. And we will look at some caveats around this approach and it's kind of important to know some of the limitations that we will experience, especially if you are using a local file storage instead of a cloud service, for example, with an expirable link for a large file, which is almost 100 megabytes, if we try to download this using this encrypted method, we will get a network failure. If we just provide a simple link that's not expirable, then we can do a redirect method instead, and that would allow the file to download appropriately. And did you know that you can go to railstore.com to get your own Ruby on Rails t-shirt or your Drift and Ruby t-shirt? To watch this full episode and more videos, visit driftandruby.com and subscribe to the Pro Membership.